So my name is Manu. Um, I'm a faculty at Stanford. Uh, I am an MIT alum. Uh, I'm delighted to be coming back after almost 10 years. Um, and one of the things, uh, when Skylar told me about this uh, conference, I was thinking, are you inviting the right person? <laughs> and he said, no, 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 you should come. And now I see the big picture, so I'm glad I came. Um, uh, there is going to be no uh, particular thread in this talk. I'll just share with uh, a few sets of things that we do. Uh, you might find it a little bit chaotic, uh, and then maybe in conversations, uh, some of those threads could get woven in. Uh, and one of the things that I'll try to do is do it a little bit biographical, just to share a little bit of uh, my time at MIT and how that shaped some of the work that I do now. Uh, OK, so this is. Uh, so before I begin, uh, this is my lab, an uh, incredible group of people that I get a chance to work with. Uh, some of our work is in the context of marine biology, uh, frugal science, uh, global health, uh, and then some of that is in from a context of programmable matter, and I'll weave through them to show you some connections. Let me start with this picture. Uh, in a conference about being material, if Lego hasn't been mentioned, it should. Uh, ironically, I didn't grow up with this beautiful material. I only learned about Lego in college, and so I had a little bit of a late blooming uh, episode. Uh, I was doing a degree in computer science, uh, but was this uh, weird kid who was thinking about Lego from a context of complexity of constructions that you could make. I found some internet never forgets, so I found this 2001 email. Actually, it turns out the question that I'd posed there had been solved for biology. There are complexity theories in understanding uh, how biology builds things. Uh, so long story short, if I had teachers like Ben and Casey, I would have stayed doing programming. Uh, but I, uh, although I had a degree in computer science, love math, just couldn't see myself sitting in front of a computer. Uh, that got me to MIT, and I started thinking quite a lot about physics of computation. Uh, it turns out these ideas have been around for a very long time. This is, again, another picture from MIT. Some red circles are people that you might recognize. Uh, there's Feynman right there. Uh, but there is a mistake uh, that ended up happening in the, the class of ideas. There could have been, we could have been way far ahead also in being materials, was the fact that physics of computation was always about what are the limits of computation. Although they recognized the fact that all computation uses physical materials, it was not an advantage. Um, and so when I got uh, to coming to my, uh, thinking about my PhD, one of the biggest fact was we can never go away from the fact that the atoms on a piece of chalk or electrons running around in your computer will always have a physical context. Why can't we actually utilize to extend what computation could do? Uh, so I started thinking about fluids. These are actually photographs of real fluidic computers from the 60s and 70s. Uh, and ironically, there were rockets flying around with that kind of hardware because, of course, electronics was not good enough at that time. Uh, this, is a, this is probably the world's largest logic gate in which you can actually pass through it. Uh, it's all hydraulic. Uh, and people started pushing this down. This was very important work because uh, it did not uh, get impacted with all the extreme temperatures and environments. And uh, probably the only equation in this uh, talk uh, is, ironically, much of this work doesn't scale down, uh, which is what you need to do to build complexity, primarily because of the linearity of Stokes' flow. So when you write down and you uh, linearize, uh, uh, when you become smaller, many of these equations linearize and they're time reversible. And you miss out the fact that there are no nonlinearities, so you can't actually build computers. So I wanted to change that. And the reason I wanted to change that was this photograph. This is Giacomo, the father of green chemistry and essentially the father of combinatorial chemistry. Is the fact that if you had tiny little vials, he was running solar chemistries looking for dyes and compounds that would survive uh, the sun. Uh, and I wanted to do this at a much, much, much smaller scale so I don't have to rent a balcony at MIT to do large-scale reactions. And uh, of course, this is uh, an arts conference as well. So I want to show this image. And one day in a train, I noticed this image. But I was thinking about these sets of ideas. And that is the image, which you all recognize, that inspired bubble logic. Uh, the idea that these little bits that could be traveling around could interact with each other with hydrodynamic flows. And quite literally, uh, that's what I build for my PhD. 
I haven't shown these slides uh, since 10 years, but uh, you get the point. Uh, essentially, these are microscopic entities, 10 to hundreds of microns, but they can communicate with each other with this invisible ether of hydrodynamics and essentially change uh, uh, its uh, course. I'm going to skip this. This is. Uh, uh, there's a technicality to it, which is the technicality was asked by uh, an external committee member uh, in my uh, PhD exam, which is how are you ever going to synchronize these sets of bits? So I sketched on a piece of paper. This became the synchronizer, although there is a beautiful mathematical structure to it. It ended up not scaling. And I kind of put this uh, on the side note uh, to eventually revisit this problem. Uh, and now, uh, uh, almost seven or eight years. So we've actually revisited the problem to now build a second platform that now allows to do synchronous computation using hydrodynamics and fluids. Uh, this is a platform uh, where you program sets of patterns. These are magnetic permaloy patterns, and these are magnetic droplets. But there is no hand of God here. These droplets sense and interact with each other uh, to, for example, in this case, build a single bit of memory. Now, these memories are much bigger than what you're used to seeing. But at that same time, you get the point. There is an energy trap right there. Uh, a droplet would come in. And the way you should be thinking about these types of computers is these are not computers to run processing or code or the way you use computers. But these are uh, completely programmable chemical factories. We can put and do things inside these tiny little drops, which uh, go all the way to nanoliters, almost the size of a volume of a cell. Uh, but then you actually program them rather than using large-scale robotics. This architecture is scalable. We can start building all kinds of uh, hardware. And I'm going to skip the technical part of this because I was, uh, yeah, I want to show other things. Uh, so just to show the point uh, that you can now do this not just with magnetic materials, but with non-magnetic materials. Now these are pure drops of water that could be programmed with this way. And if you're excited about this platform, uh, we posted all our programs, uh, the CAD tools. If you want to have fun, uh, you can also build the, the actual logic circuits using Lego uh, designers as well. Uh, but at that same time, uh, this is a completely scalable family. Uh, we will be announcing a competition uh, pretty soon with this platform to build and design some video games. Uh, but that will, there will be an actual uh, physical Mario moving around. Uh, so anyway, if you want to learn more about this, there is a little website called Computing with Fluids. Uh, I want to switch a little bit of a context to talk about simplicity in programmable materials and uh, 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 talk a little bit of a biological context to this. Uh, so the ultimate programmable matter is life. And one of the challenges that we face today is we keep teasing higher and higher complexity in life. And of course, we're making tremendous progress in terms of when we will, you know, who knows, maybe 20, 30 years from now, we'll be able to say that we understand life. Uh, but there are aspects of life that can be explored in completely abiotic systems, which Schuyler referred to a little bit. And I'll show you this video. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite. How many of you have seen this video? I'm just curious. Uh, how many of you know what that object is? Uh, so this little object right there that kind of looks like a robot uh, is a neutrophil cell right inside your body. And hopefully, some of you don't have bacterial infections. But it's trying to chase a bacteria. And of course, yay, the neutrophil wins. Uh, otherwise, we would be in trouble. Uh, this is a phenomenon called chemotaxis, where you have to connect sensing and actuation to be able to sense where en your enemy in this uh, case is. And then completely reprogram all the motors. You know, there are millions and millions of motors in the cell to be able to move in that direction. Uh, and one of the contexts was, until this point, uh, before the work that I'm about to show you, this was thought to be possible only in hierarchical, extremely complex biological systems. And I'm going to show you an example of the simplest abiotic system that demonstrates that phenomena. And we will do this in a context of a video. And since uh, 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 there are artistic aspects to it. I'll shut up and not talk. Uh, but, or maybe I will talk. This is a glass slide. Uh, what you were looking at is food coloring. Uh, when you put food coloring on a clean glass slide, first of all, it's active matter. There is energy that it's transducing. Now you should 
question yourself. I'm not coming here and telling you we've discovered a new source of energy. It's coming from somewhere. But the fact that these entities can interact with each other, this uh, they're chasing, they have an identity. So there is a sense of self. Uh, and uh, you'll see they can both identify. Uh, and one of the context of something like this is the system is so exceedingly simple that it boggles my mind. This is a property of all fluids which have a binary composition. What I mean by binary composition is any two chemicals that do not react with each other but are miscible will demonstrate a class of phenomena like this. So I spent four years uh, staring at those videos and thinking about them. It turns out this is a property of many non-equilibrium systems that they can act both as sensors and actuators. And because I'm going to run out of time, I will also leave this as a puzzle. There is a YouTube video online that you can go to repeat this experiment in your own kitchen. All you need is a clean cover slip or a glass slide and some food coloring. And you should puzzle yourself uh, by toying around with these ideas. You can make structures. This should really puzzle you whether this is truly a perpetual motion machine or not. How many of you think that this will stop at some point? OK, the other ones do believe in perpetual motion machines. So this will stop. There is a context of energy here. Uh, actually, let's just watch it. Yes. Uh, but what I want you to think about, uh, and I'm not going to explain, is how are these things talking to each other? What are the signals? Uh, how do you actually transduce that information as a signal into an actuator? And what we're discovering, in many non-equilibrium active matter, these mechanisms cannot be teased apart. And from a context of origin of life, you can start thinking about lots and lots of complex entities have emergent phenomena where sensing and actuation is one and the same thing. And uh, since I'm going to run out of time, I'm going to skip something here and tell you uh, two more things. Uh, they also have a sense of reflection. They can see themselves in the mirror. And one of the contexts that we actually use these systems is to now explore extremely large-scale interactions where we're trying to understand magnetism, how magnetism works using uh, ideas like this. OK, so I'll tell you one little bit of the last story, which is uh, the complexity that is out there in nature itself. And uh, there is an aspect of programmability here, which is shapes and sizes of life forms. So this is a picture. This is from our recent work. Uh, if you don't know, this is what a starfish looks like. And now you might ask, you know, this looks nothing like a starfish. This is the larval form. And we wondered, why is it that these shapes and forms exist at the first place? So this is nature's architecture, except we don't have the code book or asking the architecture, or if there is an architect. Uh, but one of the things that dawns on is when you apply the lens of physics to this, this is what you see. If I was to expose what that shape was trying to do, it's essentially trying to program hydrodynamics to be able to feed and swim at the same time. And there is a universal law that we can write down for these systems. And the programming is if I had a baseball, I would have shown you the shape of the seam that you would code on a baseball would program that structure, the hydrodynamic structure. Just like liquid crystals, there are defects that appear in those bands. And from that, you would program uh, the complexity, and one of the things that we're taking this is to now tell you the sea of array of animals that exist these shapes, but hopefully we'll be able to explain how these things are programmed with a singular idea. Okay, so I am on my last stretch. I don't know how strictly I have to stick to this clock, but I'll try to, uh, which is the other half of my life in thinking about, of course, it's wonderful for us to explore nature, uh, but what do we share with a broader community in the context of thinking about the previous talk. Uh, you know, there are a billion people on this planet that have absolutely no access to healthcare, no infrastructure, and of course, no access to tools of creativity. This is a picture from Madagascar uh, where we do some of our clinical work, and it takes me 12 hours to walk from a road to get to a point where there will be the places where there are villages. Uh, and one of the challenges we think about, how do you really bring both the the wonder of science uh, to places as broad as possible. And at that same time, how do you really bring important tools? So this is another context of programmable matter where we have revived back the Jeckard loom and the punch card programming. How many of you have programmed a punch card computer? 
One, two, that's awesome. This is MIT, I love it. Uh, I rarely get an answer. Uh, so what's phenomenal is uh, we could use them to program chemistry. So what you're looking at is a device that we're testing, uh, soon to test in Kenya, which allows us to do programmable chemistry using these punch card tapes to detect five species of malaria. And one of the contexts that ends up happening is it's not something magical. Anybody can reprogram, rechange, repunch, change the chips to be able to do all kinds of different assays. So rather than thinking about life sciences and biotech being a big black box and you press one button and you get a red LED and a blue LED, which is the answer. We're trying to really open biotechnology to be accessible to people at the same time, able to make tools that are important. And one of the most uh, commonly known word tool that we have scaled up is called a Foldscope, uh, which is a microscope that you make by folding paper. I have a few. Uh, and this is what is an image that comes out of it. Uh, anybody knows what this object is? I'm just curious. Uh, in a context of uh, inspiring art, these are diatoms, something that you don't often see, but when you watch them live, it turns out the biology of how diatoms glide is unknown, but the fact that they glide and they have complex behaviors themselves. And to me, uh, this is a tool that I use uh, for inspiration and problems that I search for, uh, but it was very important to build it and manufacture it in a way that every single kid in the world can have them. Currently, it's cost us around a dollar to make uh, when we, wrote the paper, I had thought that, oh, you know, when you write a paper, then it'll get adopted and everything. Nothing happens the next day when it gets published. So we made a little factory in the lab where we made 50,000 of them and asked anybody in the world who would want one, and we asked them what they would do. And that led to the entire pilot program. This is the world map where they're distributed around the world. And this community, again, coming back to Ben and Casey's point, does an incredible amount of work, I guess since I'm out of time, that you can check on this website. Uh, uh, let me just go back to the last image. This is some work from Madagascar, but we're not gonna, I'm gonna run out of time. Let me end with this. Uh, we can manufacture microscopes, but we can't manufacture mentors. And this is really where the community is as important as the scientific tools that we make, is the idea of being able to have a group of people be inspired by the world around them, uh, we need to really be able to do this. Uh, and uh, I will end here. Yes. <laughs>